the family. It's where we love, laugh, <laughs> shout and cry. Oh, fall off. It makes us who we are. But it hasn't always been the cherished institution it is today. To find out how the modern family came to be, a group of parents and kids from across Britain are turning back time to face the same ordeals as millions of others over the past 100 years. In the northern seaside town of Morecambe, the past is coming alive. A row of terraced houses has been turned into time machines to transport our families through the twists and turns of the 20th century. From the age of masters and servants... I felt a bit emotional because I knew she was there to take the children away, which is quite difficult. Through the roaring 20s to the Great Depression. Anything else of value will need to be sold. And the fact that it was in front of the family I felt really useless. From life on the home front... Another era, another separation. ..to the swinging 60s. I'm slightly concerned oh. about the length of their skirts. <laughs> and we're starting the rebellion right now. And on to the groovy 70s. I couldn't give a damn about material things. For me, family is the most important thing. And the past is going to get personal as they live the lives of their very own ancestors. Rather than just living in a museum, we're actually living an ancestor's life. She died of TB consumption. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> quite emotional. <laughs> we take so much for granted, I think. We're turning back time to find out how history made the family what it is today. There are dozens of Albert Roads in Britain, all of which have been home to generations of families. This one in Morecambe, Lancashire, is about to be the setting for something extraordinary. A row of terraced houses are being taken back to the early 1900s when they were first built. For the next five weeks, the houses will become time machines, transporting three modern families through 100 years of history. Guiding the families on this incredible journey will be working mum and queen of the breakfast sofa, Susanna Reid. This is the story of three families, but it is also the story of us, all of us and our families. And understanding what our great-grandparents, grandparents and parents went through and how that's shaped us today. Social historian Juliet Gardner will be making sure the families stick to the rules of the past. What we're trying to do here is very exciting. We're charting the development of British family life over a hundred years of history. And completing the team is antique gadget enthusiast Joe Crowley. Wow! Look at that. You wouldn't want your finger in the way of that one. The adventure for our families is about to begin. The Taylors are from Norfolk. Hard-working nurse Adele and electrician Michael have their hands full with four children. We're a chaotic family. It's just throwing all the balls in the air and seeing where they land. <laughs> we had four children because we want a busy house. But I don't want to ever be in a house that's quiet. I want to be in the thick of it with everybody there. That's but for the tailors, there just aren't enough hours in the day. Mum wants us to do this because she wants us to um, um, be together a bit more. And she wants to see what it was like in the olden days and stuff. What? <sighs> Our second family are the Meadows from Royal Berkshire. <laughs> OK, can you uh, bring down the horses, please? Self-made man Phil and his wife Susie run a polo school with the help of their teenage daughters Saskia and Genevieve. Okay, baby. For the Meadows, family means being part of a team. As a family, we probably spend more time together than most uh, families, purely because of the nature of the business and that we all play the sport. The world we live in is like a little cocoon. We deal with some incredibly wealthy people, royalty from all around the world. Everyone knows everybody. It's very nice, but it's quite limited. The opportunity to actually 
do something as a family that's outside of polo is quite uh, exciting for me. But Phil and Susie are aware just how privileged their girls are. We actually, as modern day children, don't do much housework. Me and Jennifer are quite lazy when it comes to that. It's going to be great for Saskia and Genevieve to understand how tough life was in the 1900s and how they've got it so easy, quite frankly. Our third family are the Goldings from Cheshire. Customer services manager Ian and part-time accountant Naomi have three kids. Three. Yeah. You find number 20. For them, family is all about equality. The children can see that Dad can do the washing. Good boy. And can put them to bed and bath them just as much as I can do. So it's a real modern sharing, sharing family. Even the kids get to have their say. I'd like to have family meetings and get them to say what things they're not happy with. While Ian and Naomi agree on most things, when it comes to child discipline, Ian would like to try something more old-fashioned. I don't necessarily think that being firm is always such a bad thing. I think he's going to quite like the idea of being in control. I think he thinks he's going to be respected a lot more than possibly he is now. I don't think he'll like it. I think he thinks he'll like it, but <laughs> I don't think he will like it that much. Their journey will begin in the early 1900s, when, for the first time, the family itself was something to aspire to. Number one is the height of upper-middle-class luxury. Down to number three, a typical working-class dwelling. None of the families have any idea which house they'll be living in, but it will be determined by the status of their own Edwardian ancestors, something they know little about. Which house would you like to be in? Rich. Rich, Rich one. <laughs> I know not a lot about my family history, but I'm pretty sure there isn't any secret millionaire somewhere. I definitely want to be in this house. Welcome to the start of your adventure. An exciting challenge lies ahead. You are going to put Britain's family unit to the test by living through five eras of the 20th century, and it is going to be tough. You are going to have to cope with whatever history throws at you. I'm going to do my best to assist you in your challenge by bringing you some 1900s domestic technology, which may make your lives easier, or it may not. Now, in this era, families, you've got to live according to the rules and social conventions of the time. All of you must live within the means available to people of your class. Well, I know you are all dying to find out which house you're going to be in, and all is about to be revealed. Taylors, please go to number one, Albert Road, the upper-class house. <laughs> <laughs> Goldings, number two, the middle-class house. <laughs> and Meadows, please go to number three, the working-class house. <laughs> oh, on, it's fine, we'll have fun. The Taylor family are stepping into a world of wealth and leisure. I'm your housekeeper, Mrs. McMullen. Hello, Mrs. McMullen. Hello. May I introduce you to your staff? This is Mr. Dowding, your chef. Good day. And Natasha, your housemaid. Hello. Hello. There are five of us all together. <laughs> what do we do with you? <laughs> <laughs> may, I, may I take your coat, madam? Oh. Oh. Guys, just don't break anything. <laughs> No, this is going to be very stressful. <laughs> On top of five servants, the tailors have a vast four-storey house, complete with a nursery full of toys. <laughs> and Dad, Michael, has his own private study, where he can retreat to when things get too hectic. I think this is me. I think this is where I belong. Well, I love this. I think this is brilliant. <laughs> Their home is state-of-the-art, with electricity and a boiler in the scullery, producing hot water on demand. <laughs> I'm just a bit shocked. We just expected we would be in the number three with the dirty windows. That was... because there's no money in our family, so I don't quite know how we've ended up here at all. 
Juliet has come to reveal just why they've landed the most prestigious home on Albert Road. Hello, Taylor family. Hello. 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 I've come to tell you why you're living in this rather grand house. And the reason is you've really got to thank one of your ancestors. Michael's great-great-great-grandfather, William Bennett, was at the heart of Britain's thriving cotton industry, running a mill in Derbyshire. What I perceived as my ancestors were all very much working people. OK, you've landed on your feet here. You've got a very comfortable lifestyle, but you're going to have to obey the conventions and the regulations that come with that lifestyle. So will we liaise with any of the neighbours or do we speak to them? You would keep your distance, you know. You'll be very anxious to keep your status. You know, just keep yourself separate from them. I think that's going to be a real difficult challenge for us from knowing how we like to interact with different people. Um, to actually be very standoffish to that is going to be very, very difficult. <sighs> Things will be much tougher for the Meadows family at number three. Oh, look at this. They'll be living in the most basic conditions, cooking and heating their water on an open fire. Where are we going to sit that's comfortable? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I actually, we won't be sitting anyway because there's no TV, is there? <laughs> Things are looking even worse in their only other room. Oh, what a bedroom this is. This is the only bed. Oh, God. <laughs> All four of them will be sleeping in this tiny space, with the girls sharing a mattress on the floor. Guys, do you, do you want me to worry you now? What? Toilets. <laughs> Might be a bit of a problem. <laughs> Daniel and I'm a pot to piss in. <laughs> With no bathroom, the Meadows will have to use the outside privy or face the alternative. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. I'm not peeing in that after you pee in it. Oh, look. Come on, boy. The Goldings are in the middle class house. Oh, look. Wow. Oh, I love it. It's a modest but respectable home with seven rooms. There's no electricity, but plenty of options for an evening's entertainment. The Goldings will enjoy running water and the latest cooking range. I'm not sure how you're going to cook on there. I'm Guys, I hope you're not very hungry. So what's in this book, guys? Each family has been given a manual explaining the rules they're expected to live by. Father is the head of the house. His word is law. Do you know what? I've been waiting for that for years. <laughs> Children <laughs> should speak only when spoken to. Oh, this is music to my ears. <laughs> Before the Goldings settle in, they must change into the appropriate clothing of the time. It's not really very attractive, is it? <laughs> My little Edwardian sailor. <laughs> oh, your cutest picture. Susanna has come to explain to the Goldings why they're living in the middle class house. We have tracked down hmm. your great great grandfather. Right. And here he is. His name was Nathan Lutsky. <laughs> and he was a tailor in <laughs> Cardiff which puts you in the middle classes. Mm -hmm. But he didn't originally hmm. come from mm -hmm. Cardiff. So as where was he from originally? What does it say? Yeah, Russia. Look at that. Well, I have no Never idea heard that about name. any of that. Like thousands of Russian Jews, Nathan Ludsky emigrated to Britain around the turn of the century. Unusually for an immigrant, he prospered from the start. What this means mm. is that you are going to avoid getting your hands dirty. <laughs> it means that you are going to have a white-collar yes. job. Next door, Joe Crowley has arrived to tell the polo-playing Meadows why they're living in such humble circumstances. So, this is the 1901 census, yeah. West Ham in London. But if we come down here, we see James Meadows. James Meadows was Phil's great-grandfather, who worked in London's East End as a general labourer. And that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be out there doing yeah. manual jobs. <laughs> you have to find jobs day to day and just get stuck to bring in. bring the money in. 
And Joe has a surprise for Saskia too. You're going to be working two doors down at the big house, okay? Oh, lovely. You're going to be a scullery maid. Yes, I've Let heard. me see your hands. <laughs> They're quite manly. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think these beautiful nails might Thanks. toughen up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I'm just working out how much we need to earn, and it's not going well. In the Edwardian era, families who couldn't pay their rent faced instant eviction. We need to earn 22 shillings and twopence a week to pay our bills. As a general labourer, Phil will have to find his own work, but at best he'll earn two shillings a day. So he'll have to rely on the others to make up the difference. Right, deep, deep, team, family. This is all about the family, remember? Let's try and keep it together. I clearly didn't marry very well. <laughs> I should have known better. We find ourselves impoverished, and uh, it's going to be really hard, I think. <laughs> While the tailors and the Goldings settle down for a comfortable night's sleep, the Meadows are facing a very different prospect. Tomorrow, the hard work begins. It's 6 a.m. and the working class meadows are in for a rude awakening. In Edwardian times, a knocker-upper was the alarm clock for the masses. Hi, morning. <laughs> Hello, good morning. You have a good day now. Lovely. See ya. Oh. It's really inconvenient. I mean, there's no room for anything. It's all, uh... I mean, there's nowhere to put your clothes. We sleep under anything that will keep you warm at night, because it's freezing, there's no heating. So, and then everyone's on top of each other like this all the time. Um, uh, so it's, it's incredibly inconvenient. For the working classes, living in poverty meant life was a slog from the moment they got up. Everything takes so long to do. Everything's a major palaver. And all you do is think about food and tea and warmth. Food, tea, warmth. <laughs> That's it. That's all you care about. For the meadows to keep their heads above water, 17-year-old Saskia has been forced to take up a role as a scullery maid. Seeing as my dad's not got any work, my mum hasn't got any work, I've got to go and spend my entire day scrubbing and cleaning. A reluctant Saskia heads off to work for the tailors under the watchful eye of housekeeper Mrs McMullen. I probably come across as a bit of a scary lady. I, with the little glasses and I'm short, I have very high standards. I am very, very intimidating to work for. Hello, I'm Saskia. Hello, Saskia. Now, normally you would not come in through the front entrance. This oh. is not the servant's entrance. OK. But you can come in today. As a scullery maid, you are the lowest of the low. Yes. You girls are ten a penny. You will be chopping, filleting, gutting, plucking, and a lot of scrubbing. Lovely. What she won't be doing is ever fraternizing with her new employers, the tailors, who are waking up to the extravagance of upper middle class life. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, pleasant morning. This is quite nice. Yeah. My high servants when we go home. <laughs> <laughs> the upper classes had staff for even the most personal of chores. Of course, it's feel really strange because you can't actually breathe properly in them. The richest families could have as many as five servants for each family member. In some respects, it feels like I've regressed back into childhood where you, you have your mother to dress you in the morning and tie your shoelaces. Everything Michael and Adele are used to doing for themselves is now done by someone else. Please come in. Thank you. Even looking after their kids. 
Nanny Hutchinson, sir, madam. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, miss. Good morning. I shall endeavour to instruct the children academically, morally and spiritually. Are they all in good health at the moment? They are. Excellent. Morning. How are you, Joseph? Very good, thank you. Good. You're looking very smart today. <laughs> I am Nanny Hutchinson. How do you do? And good morning, Miss Lily. Good morning. Good morning, Nanny. Good morning, Nanny. And good morning, Miss Alice. Good morning, Nanny. Good Come morning. along then, children. Give Mummy a kiss before you go with Nanny. Kira and Katie, will you sit down now, please? I'm getting confused. I'm sorry. Kira, will you Kira. please not speak to me? Next door, Ian Golding is relishing the opportunity to get stuck into his role as the family's authority figure. Jack, would you like to take your elbows off the table, please? Thank you. Why are you crying, Jack? You're not like Daddy talking to you like this. No. Always attempting to better themselves, the middle classes were determined to keep up appearances, even behind closed doors. Wash your hands, please. I would like to think that they will appreciate how important it was to behave properly a hundred years ago, and that sometimes we don't really behave as politely and as nicely as children used to. That's being a mini. Having some of the, the manners of, of their predecessors actually is not such a bad thing. Can I see if you washed your hands properly? They're wet, Kira. Could you dry them, please? Thank you. Strict discipline was a cornerstone of Edwardian child-rearing but it's a foreign concept to the Golding children. Edwardian dads used to be strict and horrible. And we had to put our elbows on the table at home. Wealthy Edwardians were obsessed with formality, even at breakfast time. This one's. Sausage, bacon, oh no, kidneys, bacon. This one's lobster. I was Sorry, expecting to toast well, and bacon. jam. No, I don't want the bacon. Cornflakes. Of the Taylor clan, the only child allowed to eat with the adults is 15-year-old Megan. The other Taylor children must eat their meals in the nursery, a very different routine from home. We normally eat together, but now, we're not allowed to eat together, which is quite weird. Do it quite firmly, and then work your way down at the toilet bowl. It's just four hours into Saskia's day as a scullery maid. And what you're doing is taking off all the urine from inside the lavatory. expecting it to be such hard work. I hate washing up. It smells of food. I want to go home. It may not be glamorous, but if she sticks at it, she'll take home five shillings a week, nearly a quarter of what her family needs to stay afloat. I want to find out what year they invented the dishwasher. This sucks. <laughs> Edwardian toil may have come as a shock to Saskia, but upstairs, the Taylor children are also finding it hard to adjust. Remember that children should be seen and not heard. You do not disturb Mama and Papa downstairs. At home, they're used to doing pretty much as they please. But now, adults are the unquestionable authority. You're with your brother and your sister, who will also help to look after you. And we really do not want any silly tears. They're wobbling. At the minute, Lily is anyway. She's struggling with this. This is just not. She wants stories and play and fun. I've not heard them laugh at all this morning. Don't concern yourself, madam. The children are fine. 
I think when Nanny arrived, I felt a bit emotional because I knew she was there to take the children away. Which is quite difficult. As long as they go out and have a bit of fun, that'll be fine. Fifteen-year-old Genevieve is doing her first day of child labour. She's working with mum Susie, who, like many working-class women, has turned their family home into a laundry business. It's not washed. Yes, it is. It's got stains on it. Where? I washed it. They're taking in washing from their neighbours. Thank you very much. A washerwoman could earn up to ten shillings a week, almost half what the Meadows family needs to survive. But doing washing in this era is a laborious process. Boiling the water. I hope this hasn't got a leak in the bottom. Hand scrubbing. Oh, are you kidding me? Using the cumbersome mangle to wring out laundry. It works. It does work. Easy, actually. Making starch from potatoes. You dip them in your starch. And finally, using the flat iron. I do figure that this was absolute labour of anything but love. This was a necessity to just earn money. They hurt. They're all wrinkly and horrible because of the water. I just feel disgusting. All my nails have chipped off. But Susie's fighting a losing battle. Mum, you need to wash this again. Yeah, you see? I just touched it with that. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> so you've got your white laundry is being cleaned by the coal scuttle. That isn't very sensible, thank you, is it? Ian Golding is heading to his job at the local council office. Morning. 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 Before the age of computers and printers, Edwardian businesses relied on a small army of clerks. Today, Ian will be working as an envelope addresser, and he'll be doing nothing else for the next eight hours. This is the kind of job um, that a very junior person in an office might do in terms of stuffing envelopes. But for what I would imagine a middle class office worker today, this is not really the kind of job that they would uh, be used to doing. It might be menial, but the job earns him a secure income of 57 shillings a week, something Phil Meadows can only dream of. He's out looking for casual work, walking in the footsteps of his great grandfather, James Meadows. You need anything with a man with a wheelbarrow, moving rubble around, anything like that, you know where I live. So you all fill up, eh? don't need any labourers. Skilled man, tough hands. We'll roll that down, Matt. God, this thing's heavy. I have a new respect for guys that do that now. I tell you what, that's tough work. Four p.m. After seven hours of hard graft, Susie is ready to return her first load of washing. How are you today? Okay, very well, thank you. Good. I owe you five pennies, sir. You yes. owe me. Is that that's per item? No, we said the whole price was five. I think we said per five item. Penny. No, it's five pennies per for the for the whole job. For the whole job. Yes, it was. Okay. Three, four, five. Susie's coming to terms with just how cheap her labour is in Edwardian Britain. A sheet for two pence is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> soul-destroying. <laughs> Completely soul-destroying. It's nearly five o'clock. The end of the day for office workers. Boring, bored, boring. The only words that are coming to my mind so far, I think, me, me doing this job absolutely sums up middle class Edwardian life. A little bit stuffy, a little bit boring. Good afternoon. 
I am now absolutely in Edwardian middle-class man mood. I absolutely expect my dinner on the table with a roaring fire in the kitchen and a cup of tea. Hello, how are you? What are you doing in here? You're not allowed to be in the kitchen. Can you leave, please? You do not come in this kitchen. Leave the kitchen. Mother, why are you letting them come in the kitchen? I thought they were OK to come in the kitchen. No, they're not supposed to be in the kitchen. No, are they not? I why, why are the stairs still covered in dust? Uh, I haven't had time to do that. Well, what have you been doing? I've been cooking your dinner and cleaning everywhere no, else. please don't speak back to me, Mother. Oh, sorry, I thought you asked me a question. Yeah, he wants to see you when you come home from work. He needs to understand that this yes, is the I'm... way it was. I know. I'm not meant to go and comfort them if they're crying. So there'd be no emotional caring at all. I don't know how they trying to work out how Edward and Jordan comforted themselves. I guess they just comforted each other. Hey. But they must have been a lot tougher than Jordan today. Katie, would you mind going to get Jack a tissue, please, for his nose? Something to wipe his nose, please. The reality that being an Edwardian family is actually not a lot of fun for the majority of the time. Um, all I seem to have done is made the children cry um, because I just have to be very strict all the time. I'm not a lot of fun at all, so I'm looking forward to actually being able to talk to my children whenever I fancy talking to my children, um, holding them whenever I want to hold them, cuddling them when they're sad, and just having a conversation would be nice because we're not even allowed to do that. Phil has been working on the streets all day for a wage of two shillings. He'll need to do this every day to stand a chance of keeping a roof over his family. I'm exhausted. I mean, you need to just dig in, dig deep and get on with it. And, and, and the only way you can do that is by almost slightly switching off. Meanwhile, daughter Saskia is coming to the end of her first day as the tailor's scullery maid. I thought when we're on camera, would have to do the chores, but then when it was like cut, I thought we'd be able to <laughs> go up, go and get some food, <laughs> have a chat amongst everyone. I didn't realise we actually had to live like families did in the 1910s. So it's a bit of a shocker. After 12 hours of hard graft, Saskia's finally been allowed back home. Hello, darling. <laughs> OK, listen to this. I need to sit down by the fire. So you walk in and it's all heated and they've got chandeliers, drawing rooms, pianos, nursery. They've got a chef, um, a housekeeper, a maid, another maid. Um... We're very proud of you at working, Sess. There we are. Right. You're going there to bring home five shillings. It must have been really hard to think that they're only in this life to earn money for their mum and dad. <laughs> uh, no, this is just the next... You have kids to supplement your, your family income. You don't really necessarily have kids to want to love and cherish like we do. <gasps> I'm so tired. There's one big role, and that is to put the food on the table. And, uh... It's really tough to do that. I'd spent the whole day worrying that I can't provide food for them. I was a useless parent. I can't look after my daughter. They're all going to be really unhappy. The pressure is hard. It's survival. Hey. <laughs> As an upper-middle-class man with an income almost 40 times greater than the Meadows and plenty of leisure time to spend, Michael's taking son Joseph clay pigeon shooting at Leighton Hall, a local stately home owned by Mrs Susie Reynolds. Taylor, Mrs. Welcome. Reynolds. Hello, welcome. Hello, thank you. Hello, Hello. Hello. Welcome. Also on the grounds is Phil Meadows. Unlike Michael, he's not here to enjoy himself. He's been given a day's work shoveling manure. I didn't like being called by my surname. 
For some reason, I didn't want to raise my eyes to them. I didn't want to look them in the eye. I definitely felt that, which is weird. I wasn't expecting it. Fantastic. It may well have been that you basically were so frightened of doing something wrong and getting the sack that you basically you did the minimum possible and just kept working. Yeah. Etiquette dictates that Michael could bring only his son with him to shoot, leaving the rest of the family behind. The advantage of this era for the gentleman is that he does get to go out and do the things that are really exciting, but to the detriment of the relationship between myself and the family. Also enjoying the great outdoors with their nanny are the two youngest Taylor children, Lily and Alice. Well, of course, working with them so much, you do get very attached to them. They are very delightful children and very well behaved. It's got a <laughs> on the whole. But for the remaining members of the Taylors, Adele and eldest daughter Megan, there is little to fill their day. I feel a bit resentful of Michael, who's gone out living the life of Riley, can't even be bothered to tell me where he's going <laughs> or when he'll be back. I feel like a, a prisoner in, in this house. There's this illusion of this powerful woman with the status and this fancy house, and actually, it's all lies. Adele might feel she has things tough, but two doors down, the grind of working-class life is getting to Susie Meadows. One shilling and eight pence. The women of the 1900s must have been absolutely rock-like. They, they would have eaten after the rest of their family, especially their children. They had to be up earlier than everyone else. They had to go to bed later than everyone else. It makes me quite emotional, actually, because, oh, dear. While the drudgery of life hits home for her mum, daughter Saskia is starting to embrace hard work. You've done very well so far, Saskia, and I'll come and see you again shortly. Thank you. I just know that I have to get on with it now, so I might as well do it in a, in a nice fashion, or I'm not going to get on with Miss McMullen. Tea? Upstairs, it's the first time Adele has seen Michael all day. And she's still waiting to see the children. Good afternoon, madam, sir. May I present the children to you? I'd like to give that to the man. Wow, look at that. Like the feathers. Did you pluck the animal yourself? What have you been doing upstairs? Had a game of chess. We've been for a walk. Wow. Was it nice? You have been very busy. Wealthy Edwardian women often spent little more than an hour with their children before they were whisked back to the nursery by Nanny. Good afternoon, Miss Meghan. In Edwardian times, perhaps the women didn't know any better. They had no expectations that spending time with their children perhaps would be a nice thing. It wasn't expected of them, so they didn't think to ask. Whereas that's the norm for me. Initially, when we were told we were coming into house number one, and you turn around and see the grandeur of it, I kind of thought, great, this is going to be a really good experience. And then the reality kicked in that, in fact, actually, you wouldn't know your family, you wouldn't know your kids, because you never see them. Evening. Michael is leaving the family again for another social engagement. Mr. Taylor is attending the local music hall, where he'll have his own private box. But he won't be the only resident of Albert Road there, as the Meadows have scraped up a few pennies for four tickets in the stalls. I'm here on my own, which is a horrible feeling, knowing that Adele and the children at home, and they would love the show. After seeing the Meadows, downstairs all singing and clapping and enjoying themselves. I just felt really lonely up there on my own. Up in the gallery, the boy 
I miss the kids and I miss being around the wife and stuff like that. Sorry. <laughs> It's hard. It's hard. Meanwhile, Adele, home alone, is expected to be more concerned with improving the family's social standing. Right Honourable Bertram Catterall Maddox. So Juliet has tasked her with holding a lavish dinner party for some illustrious guests. I just don't think I'm posh enough to associate with people from, with a law degree from Cambridge University. I'd rather invite the working class people from down the road or we can have a jolly old knees up in here, but I don't think that's going to happen. Make believe was so real to him, could see him getting rounder. It's nearing the end of the week in the Edwardian era, and the Taylor children are becoming accustomed to the new family dynamic away from their parents. I think it's fun being with the nursery because there's lots of toys and things to do, and downstairs there's sitting down and books. I think they're missing us more than we're missing them, actually. Because <laughs> we're having quite a lot of fun, but Mum says it's a bit boring just sitting there doing sewing, so... Yeah, I think they're missing us more. <laughs> After spending most of the week cooped up inside, Adele has discovered one way for her and Megan to escape. How do you get out? Are we locked in? Oh, you kidding? <laughs> bikes! With a hefty price tag, bikes were only for the wealthy, but they offered a new independence for women who had always been driven and chauffeured. They now had the freedom to travel alone. This bit of Edwardian life, I like. It's strange how after being locked in a house, you feel like you just got this bit of freedom. I want to run around the park going, yeah, free! And I'm, I'm kind of just not wanting to go back home. Did you eat anything last night? No, we couldn't eat him. Back on Albert Road, Ian Golding is comparing lifestyles with his lowly neighbour. So you've had bread this morning? No, because there's nothing to... Unless you want to eat dry bread, there's nothing to put on so it. So what did you eat this morning? Well, we haven't eaten. We had a very nice pigeon pie last night, because okay. we want to aspire to be like the... Do you? The poshies at the oh. end, you see. Historian Juliet has some news for the social climbing Ian that might bring him down to earth. You can aspire to go to join them, or you can join my revolution. Ah, it's totally oh, up okay. to you. <laughs> depends if you want to live or not. I have to tell you, actually, the divide between you and the Meadows is much less than you think. Ian is living the life of his great-great-grandfather, Nathan Ludsky. But on the other branch of his family tree is another ancestor, Abraham Weinstein, whose life in Britain was very different to Nathan's. They would have come over at right. the time of the pogroms, after the assassination of the Tsar. At one point, about 91% of the residents of Spitalfields in the East End of London were Jewish. Well, yeah. now, your own family, you know, the, the two parents and the four children, the six people, were all living in two rooms. It makes me feel very humble because I, I think I, I've ignored my family history completely. And I don't know why. It's just, it's never something I've shown any interest in. Mm -hmm. Life was hard for the Weinsteins, and within 10 years of arriving, Abraham's wife, Kate, died at the age of only 39. So she died in December She died the same age as us. Yeah. She died of TB consumption. <laughs> I'm starting to feel quite emotional. Oh, uh... <laughs> mm. oh. Oh. We're very spoiled. We take so much for granted, I think. You wouldn't have been able to do that 100 years ago. You couldn't take anything for granted, really. No. We're bloody lucky, <laughs> bloody lucky to be here, and we're lucky 
to be how we are and we could be like the meadows is next door. Next door at number one, the house is a hive of activity, preparing for tonight's grand dinner party. Go right down. Yeah, that's Mrs lovely. McMullen needs extra hands to make sure the evening runs smoothly, so she's promoted Saskia to housemaid. Transfer your weight. Down, 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 down. Now, welcome to the scullery, Genevieve. Downstairs, Genevieve has been taken on as Saskia's replacement in the scullery. I am very pleased with the way that your sister has worked, so you've got something to live up to. With only one day left for the Meadows to make the 22 shillings they need to avoid eviction, Saskia and Genevieve are earning vital money for the family. I don't even know if I'm doing this right. Oh, my God, what the hell? Miss McMullen, you must pluck this pigeon, please. How do you pluck it? Um, she said she'll be down soon, but... Here. I don't know how to do it. Just start plucking the feathers off, Jen. Just grab a feather, pluck it off. <laughs> <laughs> don't get any diseases, Jenna. <laughs> to make sure that Taylor's dinner party has the wow factor, Hello, technology Michael. expert Joe has arrived to introduce Michael to the very latest in home entertainment. Right, Michael, I have something to show you. Fabulous. Do you know what this is? It looks like a camera. That's pretty good. It's a magic lantern. All right. I want you to entertain your dinner party guests with a magic lantern show. OK, I'd love to. Yes. OK. This is it for entertainment. You don't have a TV. This no, is your this is Edwardian brilliant. home cinema system. And I wouldn't let too many of these slip into the collection. Look at that! <laughs> <laughs> The Taylor ladies get dressed in their finery. Good evening. Good evening. Downstairs, the guests are starting to arrive. Mrs. Susan Reynolds. Hello, oh, Mrs. Reynolds. Good evening. I'm lovely to see you. Juliet Gardner is here to see if the Taylors can entertain like true Edwardians and do their wealthy ancestors proud. How are you? Right Honourable Bertram Catterall Maddox. Good evening, Mr. Michael. Yeah, kind of you to ask me. <laughs> How would be best to address you? Oh, Bertie. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do nice of me. Please take a seat. Oh, right, seems... are you ready? No, you're not. Because you haven't got this prepared. Newly promoted Saskia is doing her best to keep service on track. Take them. Right, once you've washed them on here, once it's all washed, dry. I know, I know. Don't how drop do anything, dry, but we've got to do it quick time because we need it all again. Now, these slides are, are quite special. Upstairs, the guests are enjoying the Magic Lantern Show. Uh -oh. oh, that's good. Okay. Even the reluctant Adele is getting into the spirit of things. Oh, God. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my mistake. <laughs> 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 very, very good. Round of hope and glory. Next door, the middle class Goldings are entertaining themselves. You are singing brilliantly. Ian has decided to abandon strict Edwardian discipline. To be able to hold Jack is the first time I think I've, I've held him. It was lovely, it was really lovely. It makes me feel more like a dad. I, I, you know, I'm a dad, not a father. So to have the opportunity to hold him was lovely. This is very pretty, sir. Yes, yeah. very pretty. We either need to be taller, I think, or our decorations taller. An evening like this one could cost more than a poor family had to live on for two years. Yes, she is, yes, she is. If there are no calamities, I will be absolutely amazed because she's notoriously clumsy. <laughs> but it's not Saskia who slipped up. What? Are you kidding? Jeremy, that's not funny. I didn't all. mean to do it, Saskia. This is taken out of our wages. 
on a serious note because that was the first thing that Miss McManus said to me. At nine pence, a bone china cup costs almost a day's pay. I'm very annoyed at my sister. We're probably going to be back to nearly zero. So I'm not very happy and my parents are going to be livid. I want to be honest, but I'm scared of Miss McMartin McMola. Miss I don't know her name. Genevieve needs to pluck up the courage to confess to a busy Mrs. McMullen. Um, while I'm pushing up, please open, open up the lid. Um, no, you're not set. Um, yes. Mrs. McMullen, while I was pushing up, I went to dry this um, cup yeah. and it fell off the table. Right. And it smashed. What colour was it? Uh, it's one of the white ones. All right, I think that's the I'm sorry. It happens. Luckily, Mrs. McMullen has her hands full, and Genevieve's off the hook. <laughs> Dinner parties were all about excess, and tonight Adele will have to see her way through eight sumptuous courses. If the lady of the house actually knew how many courses there were, maybe she adjusted a corset <laughs> appropriately. First come the hors d'oeuvre. No, thank you. Thanks very much. Followed by asparagus. You weren't in the Navy, but you weren't nicking <laughs> socks. <laughs> Two fish dishes. One meat dish. Genevieve's pigeons. And vegetables presented with typical Edwardian flamboyance. But however grand the meal, for Adele, the evening is meaningless without her family. We've had the most wonderful food, foods I've, I've never tasted in my life before, like being in the fanciest restaurant I've ever been. And I haven't been able to enjoy it because the family haven't, they, they haven't been, they haven't been with us while we've had it. It's, sorry. The residents of Albert Road are preparing to leave the lives of their Edwardian ancestors behind. After living their life, I feel more detached from my ancestors. It's nice to do all the great things and do the stuff, but I don't want to do things on my own. I really don't. I want to do things with my family. My ancestors, I don't know how they must have lived like this. And my family's found it difficult when there's four of us in this house and we're only here for five days. For them to live like this for the rest of their life must be very difficult and it's quite heartbreaking. Susanna and Juliet are back to catch up with the families. It's time to find out how the family unit has survived the Edwardian experience. Have our families lived like true Edwardians within the rigid class structure? How has it been for you living in the posh house? It's been horrible. Absolutely awful. I didn't see the children. I didn't see my husband. Me and Megan were locked in this room 90% of the time with nothing to do. There's no purpose. As a busy working mum, every minute of the day is looking forward to family time, trying to, to catch that time with with children and just having nothing to do, no purpose, nobody needs you, you've got no say in anything as a, as a woman in this era. I could walk out this door and nobody would notice that I wasn't here, probably for days. What do you think is most distinctive about the Edwardian family unit? It seemed like a bunch of single people living in a big house. I don't think there's any such word as the Edwardian family. Next door, the middle-class Goldings are less disparaging of the early 1900s. Evenings, you know, the way the Have family behaved in the evenings, yeah. it is so easy just to turn on the TV. I think it would be nice not to do that all the time. Meanwhile, Ian, you've had to take on the role of the strict Edwardian father. Your role sounded like the one that you might enjoy. Strictness for an Edwardian father seems to be just for the sake of being strict. 
the Edwardian father needs to understand that it's not such a bad thing sometimes to show a bit of emotion. But trapped in the cycle of survival, the working class family had it hardest. We, we really lived this and it was bloody awful. Uh. I and mean, it really was. The first few days until we got our act together, it was just awful. And then we kicked in you know, and, and we made it work. But we could have easily gone the other way or just gone home, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <laughs> well, Juliet, how have they done financially? I've got your budget here. So your total outgoings in your week were 21 shillings and 10 pence. We OK. <laughs> so now let's look at your income. As a family, you have earned 28 shillings for and a half pence. Uh -huh. So well done. Pretty good. You've lived within your budget and some. Well done. I think it pushed us to the, to the max now. I think as a family, we, I think we did really well. Children's reaction to this has actually amazed me. <laughs> I cannot believe. The girls have really had to change because if anything, they're probably, you know, they're a little bit more sport at home. But I've been so proud of both of them. For the families, it's the end of the Edwardian era. Next time on Albert Road, it's the Roaring Twenties. Cheers. Might be a little bit bumpy here, madam. That's OK. But the Great Depression is just around the corner. I'll leave you with four chairs, but anything else of value will need to be sold. Who will ride the storm? No, we haven't oh, sold that yet, no. <laughs> we'll sell the kids first. And who will see their fortunes slip away? <laughs>